In our last lesson, we talked about heat, thermal energy, how it works, and how we can measure it. But we said that heat really is the transfer of this thermal energy, and that thermal energy is the movement of molecules. And as these molecules are moving in any object, any substance, they're generating a certain amount of thermal energy. In today's lesson, we want to look at how that thermal energy, how that heat, can be transferred from one object to another. Now we said that in warmer objects, the molecules move more rapidly, and in cooler objects, the molecules move less rapidly. So essentially, anytime heat's transferred, it's happening because these warmer, more rapidly moving molecules are bumping into, moving against, slower moving, cooler molecules. Often when we talk about heat, we use the term excite to describe what happens to the molecules. And we might think, oh, I'm excited, I'm going to the beach, or I'm excited, we don't have school today. But in the way we use it here, we're talking about excitement as movement, action. Because as the slower moving molecules get bumped by the rapidly moving molecules, they start moving more rapidly, which gives them more thermal energy. A good example that represents what's going on on the molecular level is playing pool. And anyone who's ever played pool, you notice when you first take that cue ball and hit the rack of balls, the balls are at rest. They're not moving until that cue ball hits them, but then they start moving rapidly all over the place because the rapidly moving cue ball transferred its energy into all the pool balls to make them all move. That's essentially what happens on the molecular level. A rapidly moving warm molecule will bump into cooler molecules and causes them to start moving more rapidly, transferring most of its energy to the cooler molecules. Now there are three different ways that this transfer of energy can happen. And those three methods are conduction, convection, and radiation. Now if you were paying attention in fourth grade science, you probably remember these from our energy unit. And we discussed them briefly then when we talked about heat energy, but we're going to talk about it now in a lot more detail. Now the first method of heat transfer that we mentioned was called conduction. And conduction is a method of heat transfer that happens between two objects that are in direct contact with one another, two objects that are touching. And you see in the picture here, we've got the steak cooking in the pan. The heat is being transferred into the steak from the pan as the steak is touching the pan. So that direct contact is an example of what we call heat transfer by conduction, two objects that are touching one another. So just like we saw a minute ago, when conduction happens, the molecules in the hot pan are moving very rapidly. You put the steak in the pan, those molecules are moving more slowly. But through that contact, the rapidly moving molecules start bumping against, bumping into those slow moving molecules, just like the pool balls, causing them to move more rapidly, causing them to gain heat, to gain thermal energy. Essentially what's happening is the warm pan is giving some of its heat energy to the steak. Now some other examples of heat transfer by conduction include things like cooking an egg or anything that we cook in a pan like that. Ironing clothes, we take the hot iron, we put it on the clothes, that energy, that heat transfers from the iron to the clothes to get our wrinkles out. Touching a hot surface, when we touch something and we say, oh, that's hot, that heat is transferring into our hand and that's why if we leave our hand on something hot too long, that heat will actually burn it because it's transferring that energy, burning our skin. Holding an ice cube is an example of us touching not something hot, but something cooler. And something that's important to understand about the transfer of heat, heat always transfers from a warmer substance to a cooler substance. So in the case of the ice cube, we're not transferring cold from the ice into our hand, even though we think, oh, that feels cold, now my hand feels cold. What's really happening is the heat, the thermal energy from our hand is transferring into the ice cube. So the ice cube's gaining heat from our hand while our hand is losing heat to the ice cube. It makes the ice cube melt, but it also makes our hand feel cooler. Now the second method of heat transfer that I wanna look at today is one called convection. And convection describes the transfer of heat, the transfer of thermal energy through a current of liquid or gas. Now as we look at examples of convection, one major example is ocean currents, and that's something that we'll look at a little bit more when we get to the weather unit also. But ocean currents, it could be a current of warmer water, such as the Gulf Stream, 
that as it moves into cooler water, it's transferring its heat to that cooler water around it, causing ocean water to be warmer than it normally would. Hot air balloons are also an example of heat being transferred by convection. We often hear it said that warm air rises because it's lighter, it's less dense, and that's the principle that causes a hot air balloon to work. As the air in the balloon gets heated, that warmer, less dense air rises up into the atmosphere, and that's essentially causing what we call a convection current. It's the movement of warmer air upward in the atmosphere and the movement of cooler air down closer to Earth's surface. Something similar happens in water as water is heated. And if we boil a pot of water, what we notice happening is if we're measuring the temperature at the top of the water and the bottom of the water, if we're heating it on the stove, the water becomes warm at the bottom. But that warmer water rises up because again, it's less dense. It's creating that convection current. So you have this rising warm water warming the water around it. And it's kind of this ongoing cycling convection current happening inside a pot of water as we heat it on the stove and as we eventually boil that water. The last type of heat transfer that we're going to look at today is what's called radiation. And when we talk about heat transfer by radiation, we're talking about the transfer of heat, not by direct contact, not by currents, but by invisible electromagnetic waves through open space. This is different than the other two methods of heat transfer that we talked about. With conduction, we have to have direct contact. With convection, we've got to have that current of air, that current of water that's moving, that's transferring. But with radiation, this is actually transfer essentially through empty space. One of the most significant examples of radiation for us is sunlight and how it warms the Earth. Because the sun's in space, which is a vacuum, there's no molecules to bump into each other to rub together. But thanks to these electromagnetic waves from the sun, our planet's able to be heated and it's able to support life. When we cook over a campfire, roasting marshmallows or hot dogs or something like that, we're not putting our marshmallow directly into the fire. We're holding it above the fire, but because of that radiated heat from the fire, it's able to warm the marshmallow, to warm the hot dog, so we're able to cook that way. Even a burner on a stove, we can touch the burner and it will burn us. We can set our pan on the burner and it'll heat the pan through conduction. But even by standing near a heat source like that, even when we're not touching it, we're still able to feel heat from it. And that's because in addition to conducting heat through something that's touching, it's radiating heat around it. So it is possible to have more than one method of heat transfer happening at the same time. We cook our food on the stove by conduction, but we feel warmer standing next to the stove because of radiation. This picture of the pot over the fire is a really good example of all three methods of heat transfer taking place at once. In this example, the fire is radiating heat that's being used to heat the pot and the water. So as the pot warms up, that's transferring heat but through conduction into the handle of the pot, which if we're holding on to it will start to become warm, and also into the water. But then just like we talked about with warm water, it's going to want to rise up to the surface. So it's also creating that convection current inside the pot as the water is heated. So again, it is possible to have multiple, and in some cases, all three examples of heat transfer working together at once to heat something. Now we'll look at some examples in class and in our videos of all three of these methods of heat transfer. We'll look at maybe which ones are more effective, which ones are less effective. And over the course of the unit, we'll also look at how we can limit or encourage these types of heat transfer to take place as we talk about conductors and insulators.